Good morning, church. How are you doing? It's good to be back. A couple of announcements before we begin. I would like to announce that the catechumens who were questioned yesterday at my parsonage passed their questioning. So that's good news. So that means next week, yeah, they're not here to be embarrassed by this announcement, but oh well, we can announce it again later. But um, that means next week is a catechism or a confirmation Sunday. So please join us to support our catechumens as we receive them into full fellowship here at St. Thomas and add them to our full members roll book. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> also, this week at Christ Lutheran, we are having vacation Bible school. This begins June 24th and it goes until the 28th. So it begins tomorrow. And we will be having this in the evening from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, we will provide dinner for anyone who comes, and then we'll just have a great time. So if you're interested, please attend Vacation Bible School. Uh, we can always use extra hands. Also, a reminder, in July, we will, begin, we will be beginning Christian Education Night here at St. Thomas. Uh, we'll have Christian Education Night every Thursday, beginning July 11th, and we'll basically be walking through the Christian faith. This is a great event for you to familiarize yourself more thoroughly with what you believe as a Christian, as well as to invite friends or family who might not be acquainted with our tradition to learn as well. There are no commitments whatsoever. This isn't a membership class. It's just a time for discussion and meditation. And now that it looks like our catechumen, one of our catechumens has walked in. She passed her confirmation, <laughs> her questioning yesterday. So let's give thanks to the Lord for that. I have to embarrass you, Nicole. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, those are my announcements. One more announcement. There will be no Bible studies this week at Christ or St. Thomas. Why? Because pastor's involved in VBS as well. So I'll be spending my time prepping for that. Robin? Yeah, yeah, so uh, we've had a lot going on at Vacation Bible School. My schedule's been pretty busy. Christina's has been extremely busy preparing for this. So the mini women's retreat is postponed for now. Your name is still on the sign-up sheet, and we'll notify you when we're actually having it, but we actually need to have time to plan it. So it's postponed for a temporary amount of time. Are there any other announcements? Oh, here's Gabe. Congratulations, Gabe, on passing your question. <laughs> If we embarrass Nicole, we have to embarrass Gabe as well. <laughs> okay, are there any other announcements? Huh? Yeah, Stephanie, she passed questioning. I'm joking. <laughs> she survived. She survived catechism. Okay, let's begin with our opening hymn. Please rise.
say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Confess our sins. God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I pronounce the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your mercy, guide the course of this world so that your church may joyfully serve you in godly peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. lesson is a reading from the book of Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. This is the word of the Lord. Thank be to God. We read Psalm 124 responsively. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, then they would have swallowed us up alive. Then the flood would have swept us away. Then over us would have gone. Blessed be the Lord. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading is from the second letter of St. Paul to the church at Corinth. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. By great endurance and infliction, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love. By truthful speech and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children. 
widen your hearts also. This is the word of the Lord. According to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep, on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. So it's usually my custom, as you know, to either preach from an outline or from memory. That has its benefits, such as this illusion of natural human communication. However, it also has its weaknesses. Usually the articulation of language isn't as exact, and the wording and phrasing isn't as intentional as you would have with a manuscript. So today I'm going to read from a manuscript just because of the topic. (laughs) Knowledge puffs up. We humans can do amazing things. We can divide atoms. We can engineer skyscrapers. And we can even map the human genome. Yet as amazing as our knowledge may be, which is why we can do these things, there is much more about ourselves and the world that we don't know. It is estimated that each human only possesses 2% of the knowledge available to humanity. Only 2%! And that's being generous. And that's only 2% of the knowledge that we do have. Not the knowledge that's out there for us to possess. So while we are smart, and I am not questioning that whatsoever, We are far from omniscient, all-knowing. Yet the hubris of man is that we presume to know too much. Another fun fact. The more someone dives into a subject, the less they realize they know. When people pursue advanced degrees in areas such as history, philosophy, and even science, They come to realize that a lot of what they know is merely theoretical. They come to see that what they thought was once certain is grounded in nothing more than changeable hypotheses. One of my pet peeves is when people talk about evidence. (laughs) Evidence is not rock solid. Evidence is merely data that has been used to support a hypothesis. The same data could be used in theory to support a different hypothesis. All this to say, what we know about ourselves and the world around us is extremely tentative. It's open to change. So we should probably humble ourselves. Human knowledge, or the lack thereof, is what brings us to our Old Testament reading for today. God gives Job a stern talking to. He says, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Prepare to fight like a man. 
I will question you, and you make it known to me. What has Job done wrong? He is presumed to know too much about God and his ways. In the previous chapters, Job has called in to question God's wisdom and his intention behind creating things. He has questioned whether or not God really is faithful and whether God hears his cries for help. In turn, he has directly contradicted God's promise to do these things. Job has also questioned God's wisdom in giving him life. Job has previously claimed that it would have been better if the sun had never risen on the day of his birth. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you. He has also questioned God's governance of the universe, as many people do today. And so, God puts things into perspective for Job. He poses a series of rhetorical questions about the universe to remind Job that Job doesn't know much about the cosmos, let alone his creator. Christians and non-Christians oftentimes make the same mistake when thinking about God. We make the mistake of thinking that since we are the smartest sentient beings in our universe that we know of, we are just as smart as the Creator who made all things. For this reason, we have the power and authority to criticize the Creator and question how He has done things and whether He has done anything at all. I recently read an article in the newspaper that questions the existence of a Creator. The author claims that if the universe provides evidence for design such as the complexity of the human eye, then it also provides stronger evidence against design, such as the fact that the same ID generates. If there were a designer, the author argues, why would he design eyes to degenerate? What a foolish argument. First, the complexity of an object indicating intent and design is not undermined by the fact that the object changes over time. If you were to see a Chevrolet, you would assume that it had been designed and manufactured by someone due to its complexity. Just because the Chevrolet eventually breaks down, rusts, and eventually turns into a pile of junk, I would argue that might have been a pile of junk in the beginning, does not under... I'm sorry. I'm, I have a Chevrolet. That's the joke. I drive Chevrolets. Uh, does not undermine the fact that it was made by someone with an intent and purpose, right? Second, the author fails to grapple with the fact that creation as it currently exists might not reflect the perfect will of its creator. As Christians, we recognize that on account of man's sin, creation was subject to corruption and therefore does not perfectly reflect the will of God, as God originally intended it to be. Thirdly, if there is a creator, who given the magnificence of our universe, is no doubt smarter than the author of this article, and anyone here, including myself, who is this author to think that he can know all the purposes of this creator? Who is he to think that he can know all the reasons the Creator has for designing the cosmos the way he has? I could go on. This author and Job prove nothing more by their questions than a high opinion of themselves. Specifically, what they think they know. If humans cannot grasp the intricacies of creation, let alone themselves, what makes them think that they can understand the mind of the Creator who made all things. A quote from Isaiah chapter 55. The Lord says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The agnostic New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman puts our hubris in sharp perspective when he writes, A rock has no way of recognizing that an animate object, such as a dandelion, exists. 
A dandelion has no, rec no way of recognizing that a panther exists. Now, it gets a bit tricky. A panther has no way of recognizing that a superior intelligence exists. Yes, a panther does recognize in some in instinctual sense that there are things out there to look out for. But it has no way of realizing that there are people who can engineer skyscrapers or split atoms or reconstruct the history of Rome. Humans can and do recognize, analyze, study, think about, reflect on these other forms of life. You don't need to say they are lower life forms or that we are superior to recognize this. We can understand all of these things because in some sense, not all, our cognitive abilities are superior. Then, what in the blazes should make me think that I could possibly know if there is a higher order above me, superior to me in ways that I simply can't imagine? Not just one order above me, but lots of orders. If there are such orders, there is no way I could ever know. Literally, duh. End quote. So who are we to think that we can prove or disprove the existence of a creator with our brilliance? Who are we to think that we can adequately understand his motives? Who are we to think that we can understand the extent of his power? Who are we to question what he has done? The Lord says in Isaiah 45, Woe to him who quarrels with his maker. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. Yet we do this whenever we presume to be on the same intellectual level as God. When we call into question his faithfulness, we do this. When we call into question what God has allowed, we do this. When we think that we are so smart that we can call to question the existence of our maker and say what he must do and what he must be like if he exists, we presume to know too much. Whenever we find ourselves in a state of presumption like this, we must humble ourselves and confess our sin with Job. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job chapter 42. And as much as I like what Bart Ehrman writes here, I don't like much else that he writes, <laughs> he is wrong in one respect. He says that he has no way of knowing whether or not a higher order exists. That's false. He and every human could know that a higher order exists if this higher order were to reveal itself to us. This is what we as Christians know the higher order, whom we call God, has done. He has revealed himself fully by actually taking upon himself human flesh and blood. Since we couldn't ascend into the heavens, since we couldn't escape creation to see the transcendent creator, he came down that we might have fellowship with him. The one who created all things became himself part of creation when God the Son became man, Jesus of Nazareth. In the Incarnation, we see the will and character of our Creator. We see that He is not far off and distant. We see that He deeply cares for His creation. He cares for you, so much so that He died for you willingly. He cares about the downtrodden. He hears and answers the cries of those who call to Him. Jesus, the creator, took on your flesh as a human being to represent you. He who did not consider equality with God a thing to be taken advantage of, claimed the presumptuous sin of his human creatures as his own 
by dying the death they deserve. Moreover, he has revealed his good will for his entire creation by conquering death and suffering through his resurrection, giving us a foretaste of the liberation he has in store for all of us. And this creator has made his will for you abundantly clear. The work of God is this, to believe in the one whom he has sent. The central mystery of the Christian faith is this. The invisible has become visible. The creator has become a creature that you might have fellowship with him. The holy one has become a sinner in your place. The righteous judge has suffered the condemnation of your sin, the, sin, the condemnation you deserve, so that your sin is no longer counted against you. The giver of life has died and conquered death so that you may be reconciled to him and have everlasting life. He has appointed prophets and apostles to proclaim these things so that you may believe and have life in his name. He comes to you personally, even today, through his word, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the word written, proclaimed, and tangible in water and bread and wine to deliver to you the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. God has made himself known to you in Christ Jesus. If you want to know that God loves you, that he will work all things for your good, that he is with you, and what his ultimate will for you is, look to Christ Jesus, his life, his cross, and his resurrection. Focus your mind on Jesus. Read about Jesus. Learn about Jesus. Trust in Jesus. There is no other God than the one who has made himself known by living, dying, rising, and speaking to you through his word. We may not see answers to all of our questions in this life. But we do see Jesus with eyes of faith, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Hebrews chapter 2. Amen.
Please rise. We confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wondrous works to the children of men. You hold power over wind and wave, sin and death. Deliver us from every trouble and distress and bring us at last to our eternal haven. Lord, in your mercy. God of our salvation, you have ushered in the favorable time and day of salvation through the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Support all your ministers and remove all obstacles from hearing and believing the word they preach. Let your grace be proclaimed through every hardship, struggle, and suffering. And encourage us, by the example of many saints, to consider ourselves rich and alive despite every opposition. For since we have Christ, we possess everything. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, open wide the hearts of Christians to one another, especially within the home and between neighbors. Let love be genuine, speech truthful, and patience constant. Let us commend ourselves in everything as those known by God's love and therefore unashamed to serve one another. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you rule this world by your power. Give to our civil servants respect and recognition of your creation and its nature. When they use the authority given them from above, let it be in accord with your good design for our world and not the corruption of sin, which they are to rebuke for the good of their citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Mighty Lord, you command wind and wave. Out of your mercy, spare us from disaster. Give success to crops. Send suitable rain for the earth. Give protection to those endangered by storms on land, sea, or air. And give us faith, both to call to you in trouble and to trust that you will work everything for our good, for the sake of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, you see that we are perishing. Yet you bid us to set our fears aside and trust in you for the sake of Christ, by whose blood we have received peace for our troubled consciences. Do not reject our prayers for their faithlessness, but teach us to trust in you fully. Give your protection and peace to those in need. We especially pray for Carol, Joe, Allison, Trudy, 
Palasia, Pastor Just, Loreen, Becky, Marla, Timothy, Carol, Heather, and all of those we name on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, Holy Lord, we join with the sons of God and shout for joy as Christ Jesus gives to us his true body and blood in the Lord's Supper. Let us not doubt, but firmly believe your word, that you who formed our world and its matter know well how to be present for us and our forgiveness in the sacrament. Lord, in your mercy, hear us, Heavenly Father, for the sake of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We exchange the peace of Christ with those around us.
taste of the feast to come. Thank you, Lord, for all the good things that you have given us. Make our lives dedicated to you in response. Use us and these gifts to help those in need. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed good and right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection has gained for us everlasting life. And so, with the church on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. O Hosanna, O Hosanna, O Hosanna in the highest. Blessed. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink to it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Welcome to the Lord's table. Take and eat. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you. This is the true body of Christ given for you.
gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his appearing, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.